Live from the San Jose McHenry Convention Center, it's The Cube at Open Compute Project U.S. Summit 2015. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out for the events, extract the sin from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host, Jeff Frick, who's the general manager of our Cube business. Uh, Jeff, we got Aaron Sullivan, distinguished engineer, Rackspace. Welcome to, to The Cube. Thanks, good um, to be here. Open power, open compute, power's huge. But let's get back, let's get into the conversation. Tell us what's going on with you um, this year, and give your perspective. Looking back from last year, what's going on? Yeah. I mean, Bigger, yeah, bigger, smaller, bigger. more robust. Yeah, lots of stuff, uh, lots of advancements since last year. Uh, when we talked last year, we were just launching our open compute systems onto most of the apps that are running open compute at Rackspace today. Uh, we've launched eight applications at Rackspace supporting open compute. Uh, we run it in our back office for some of our business intelligence and analytics platforms. We run it in front office for a variety of our OpenStack cloud services. We built our on-metal cloud service, which we're very proud to launch a, a very distinctive offer last summer. Uh, we built that on Open Compute. It was an exclusive sort of thing. Like, we couldn't have done it yeah. without Open Compute. Like, in which way? Like, what was there that wasn't, yeah. like, gave you the ability to do that? So, so we, uh, we needed to design a service that gave people bare metal cloud at hypervisor cloud provisioning and security type speeds and feature sets, right? So that's a tough thing to do. Uh, you, you gain a lot from that hypervisor in terms of security and speed and ease of provisioning. And when we took that out, we had to do things in the firmware of the server to replace some of those core functions and safety mechanisms that we needed. And the fact that we had open compute and the engagement with all the different engineers in the community to work with helped us get there. But we also kind of hit a wall at that point. We sort of realized the limits of where we could take open on the platform we were at, at that point in time. <laughs> and we think, we think the cloud is going to continue to evolve and need to get vastly more efficient than it is today. And in order to do that, we need to let developers, like the guys that work on our metal platform and so forth, get deeper down into those systems, <laughs> right? And, and they're, all, they're all developers and hackers, right? Those, th those sorts learn best when you just open the whole thing up right. and let them yeah, but you guys built a great system on open source as well, and yeah. here you have a community that's bringing open source. That's we were just right. talking to the GM at Microsoft. They brought large scale management templates yeah. and reference architectures to yeah. the table. That's real IP. That's, that's real IP. That's real IP, and we need more of that, right? That's, that's what we need. We need IP exposed at that layer and deeper on all the systems that Open Compute delivers today. All right, yeah. explain to the folks out there what this means, because it's like, to me, I look at it like Christmas, you know, the presents are all there, you know, you got, the, Microsoft comes with all this IP and this, yeah. the community around. As an engineer, what's it like? I mean, are your eyes popping out of your head? Are you a kid in the candy store? <laughs> what's happened? What's the, what's the psychology of, of the in the trenches uh, developer? You know, I, I think <laughs> when you first get in, your eyes are popping out of your head and you're really excited. And then after a while, this is the new normal and you feel much more empowered than you did before and you realize how much more you could do. But now you got to go do it. And it's a new, it's a more competitive world that's enabled by all of this open, uh, open technology. Uh, so it changes the playing field and it forces people to be innovative because they know everybody else can be that much more creative and innovative right, as well. Right, The, the uh, Mark Shuttleworth demo today with the, the metal as a service. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that, John, M-A-A-S. First yeah. time I'd ever see that, and that would look like a pretty yeah, that's spectacular what, amount of automation. That's what on metal is at Rackspace, right? Uh, they have Maz in that service. There's a similar service in OpenStack that we built called Ironic that delivers Ironic. a very similar service, right? We call it Ironic. Um, you can use Ironic to stand up your OpenStack hypervisor cloud. You can also use it to run a bare metal cloud service. So same idea, I point, I click, and in moments, moments, I get a bare metal image on a server configured the way I want it. So on the OpenStack rack space situation here, where does all this intersect with say OpenStack? Mm -hmm. Because you have OpenStack growing significantly with a vibrant governance model, the community's growing, that's the past, that's the infrastructure service. Now you're talking the bare metal as a service, soft layer was bought by IBM. Mm -hmm. So you got all this kind of like lines going on. How does this relate 
this development ecosystem with OpenStack. It seems to be a nice yeah. hand in glove situation. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, they don't, there doesn't have to be overlap, but there are many places where it overlaps really nicely. Uh, where having openness at each layer actually enables uh, advancement from all the communities. All three groups can benefit from having open access to some other parts. If you think about uh, what you see in bare metal provisioning prior to on metal, you usually had to wait a few hours to get that server. And the way it came up, you know, it, it may not have all of the all of the pre-configuration, all of the, it may not be set up exactly like you want it. You know, a lot of clouds you can upload your image and you can say just launch another one, launch another one. When on metal, it's it's the same sort of idea, only you get it bare metal, right? OpenStack enabled that. Yeah. Right? If, if we hadn't had everything that was already in OpenStack in orchestration, you know, it would have been that whole thing plus a bare metal element we would have had to add. And instead, we were able to just take that piece, that, that bare metal provisioning piece, and build it in. So tell us what's going on with Open Power, because that's something that's very interesting. It's a consortium that's coming together. Can you give us an update what you guys are doing with that? Yeah. What's it mean to the end user? Yeah. Who's driving it? What's, in, what's happening with that? Yeah, uh, so Rackspace, got involved with Open Power before it launched. We were engaged in the in the in with the group of companies that were talking about the bylaws and the, the board and the formation of it. We decided not to go public at the time that it launched, but very involved. We'd been looking at power for about a year and a half prior to that, because there were certain things about power that were far more efficient in some of its core features for some of our applications than, than what we had with any other platform. So we were excited about it, but we kept coming back and saying, you know what, our data center operators grew up in an x86 world with all of the stuff around it. You know, not just the, not just the processor, but the management systems, the tools, all the rest of that. And if we want to leverage this cool new technology and power, we need to go enable it by changing all those other parts around it. And then over time, that conversation switched from changing a feature, changing another feature, changing another feature to just, you know what, we're doing, we're changing things so fast, why don't we just open everything up, right? And a lot of those things that we wanted to leverage a few years ago are still there and they're advancing. You go out, you can do a search for uh, something Open Power did with a company called Redis Labs. You know, Redis is a really hot application. You can use some functions that are available in Open Power and only open, right, in Open Power. So it's a much wider sort of product ecosystem that can plug into it. You can take and enable that for Redis and you can take a server where you needed 20, 25 of them on any other platform and on a power platform you can do it with one, right? I mentioned, when's the last time we had it's an advancement change. in servers that was <laughs> that order of magnitude, right? right? It's been a long time. So what's the difference in the ecosystem here right now, this year for last year? So you're seeing like scalities here, mm -hmm. but not necessarily making hardware big, it was a good storage solution. Uh -huh. There's a software thing going on yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, Software-defined data center, we were speculating yeah. earlier. Yeah. Um, is it a land grab? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this going, hey, if I'm an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm, I'm in these trenches. Orchestration, automation, these are cloud concepts. Yeah, you I, know, this is a software construct. You can come in and say, I want to own the software-defined data center. That means you have the, the data center operating system is on the table. Can there be one, more than one? Is there only one? What's your take on that? I know it's kind of a, outside your scope, but as an industry yeah. observer, yeah. you got to see people making their move yeah, here. I, I, think, I think for our company, I think that we, we, we sort of exist outside of that fray to a certain extent. Is we've had to be operating with that uh, mentality, the whole verticalized data center stack in order to work at the scale we are. But I think that's becoming a reality for, for smaller organizations and operations today. In, in a large part because of what we and some of the other cloud oriented movements went, whether it's a service provider or a software developer, I think, I think that has turned that on. I think there's some sort of uh, I don't know if land grab is the word I would use, but there's definitely a new stack forming, and there's competition to, to say that what's that top to bottom stack, but I don't think it's just software defined stuff. I, that's there, right? Software defined network, software defined data center, like software defined storage. Those things are all there. They're going to take a while to become real products that people want to use. Some things are there, some things are not. Like we use a lot of software defined network at Rackspace today, but to see it hit like uh, everywhere else in the industry, I think I think we're still we're gonna keep moving there. You know, th there's gonna be another thing that gets turned on, and another thing that's turned on over the course of the next few years. I think there are some really radical changes down at the bottom of that stack in the chips and the servers, where we're gonna realize, like I was saying earlier, if we rethink that stack all the way down, 
not just not just the software to find stuff, but all the way down to the bottom, we can get a, a great deal more efficiency and flexibility than what we have today. So what looks like software to find sort of stack wars today, I think, turns into a whole vertical, you know, top-down stack, not just not just servers that are, that are abstracted for 50 different purposes, but servers that are extremely vertically integrated, but also open. Open, and, and here's the thing that we're, we're learning in theCUBE for the folks watching, they know the theCUBE. Workloads matter, and now it's not a one trick pony for every single yeah, workload. You can't right. have, general purpose is over now. That's right. You can't, you don't have to have a general purpose computer, you can have a purpose built app. That's right. That on purpose built provisioned, that's right. open hardware with tailored software, virtualization. Yep. Talk about that trend. I mean, how real is that now? And where are we from the, from the start line, I guess? Or are we on the start line? Is it happening now? I think we're past the start line. I think the demand of our customers and our end users for ever more efficiency and performance, ever more scale and ease to start their app and their idea, it's pretty relentless. So we've been feeling that heat for years now and it forces you to evolve. Right, it forces you to evolve to stay relevant and keep giving those customers what they want. So and it's really workload-centric tuning as opposed to just system tuning as well, that's, right? That's right, because for many of them, for many of them, the, the system itself, generation over generation, is not delivering the returns that it was. You know, we, we, we went from high clock speeds to multiple cores, and you know, we would regularly get huge boosts generation over generation in performance. But right now that's really slowing down and so you start looking for other, way, other ways to squeeze more value out of the system, right? If you listen to Jay Parikh in the keynote this morning, you know, last year he was saying, you know, we saved all of this money with open compute. This year he's saying we're saving all this money by taking a holistic look at the stack, right? All the way through, we're, you know, we're ringing yeah. out extra performance and efficiency by doing that, right? But the trend, of your, your, what you're arguing basically is the future, which is there will be unlimited opportunities to have differentiated stacks. So it's not an interest, it just brings up the open source thing. Okay, standardized hardware and everything, but I'm a developer, mm -hmm. I can create a unique stack for a unique workload mm -hmm. and have some differentiation. Yeah, competition's always going to be there, yeah. but there's no lock-in, no. but I can build my own stack. I can. I can, and, and, and there's ways, there's, you know, a lot of people think open source just sucks all the value out of, uh, out of this for anybody that's creating equipment, and you're forced to live on really lean margins, but I kind of look at it differently. Yeah. I think what it forces you to do is burn your boats. It forces you to say, <laughs> this got me here, and I got this much value out of it, but it's open, and I can't just sit on that anymore. Yeah. I have to go do the next big thing, and I think one of the next big things in that space is going to be you know, we'll come up with a, a name for it that's different because this one's been used. But it's going to be middleware for these very advanced purpose-built systems, right? Yeah. It's going to be- We just call that software. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be something that basically says that, that server is an alien compared to what we saw four or five years ago. Yeah. But I have software that knows how to intelligently use it for what it was built for so that my services developers don't have to have all of this, you know, deep system. Yeah, but this knowledge. is interesting. Burning the boats is a great analogy to yeah. the old, hey, we burned the boats, now we're stuck on the island, we're going to make it work. But platforms are out there, so there's an island, if you will, the right. land to live off of, yeah. you have a platform. So what yeah. this brings the question is, value shifting. Mm -hmm. So commoditization race to zero, so-called, you know, cloud or whatever, is one thing, that's commoditization, but value shifting. Mm -hmm. So we've heard from executives saying, hey, you know, entrepreneurs, value shifting yeah. to where the apps are. Yep. So there's interesting debates in the tech community right now of that's a bad business model. Yeah. You know, you're seeing, you know, you things. Know, we've dealt with that last year in a big way, right? There were all these price cuts in the cloud and you know, we were wondering for a little while, is, you know, there were people wondering, is this the end of us? Because we're just, if it's a race to zero on cost of infrastructure, right? And, and the people who get all the value are the ones writing the apps, right? Uh, then, then many of us are, you know, we're doomed, right? But it's really hard to run this stuff at scale. Yeah. The clouds we created today are, are, were sort of built to help people prototype and experiment at really low cost, you know, and just iterate constantly, right? So, so the entry cost to, to your idea is really low, but when that idea really takes off, you know, <laughs> where, where do these apps sit? They, they live in Google's cloud or Facebook's cloud, or it's yeah. like a Netflix with a huge engineering staff. Most of the customers that come to Rackspace don't have that level of expertise. So what they said was, look, we're moving into more advanced applications, yeah, yeah. so we need you to move with us, right? 
we, we, we customers. Well, more advanced applications, but also they're adding more features, right. faster, more agile. That's right. On a software release cycle, so the the, yeah. the software to, the life cycle is fast. Yeah, and, they, <laughs> and and as they reach a certain size and scale, their customers are going to demand more, so they're going to keep feeling that pressure, and they're going to say, look, it was easy when I only had ten servers to run this app, but now I'm at a thousand, and I don't have the expertise, you know, to optimize all of this to run yeah. on a cloud. I need your help. You know, I want the best kind of cloud and the best kind of integration service and support to help me run my app. You know, Jeff and I and Dave Vellante, who's not here, um, who's in back east, and my other, our other co-host, we always talk about this. Yeah. Competitive advantage yeah. in an open world. The yeah. old world was, we all know Microsoft, operating system monopoly with the, with the apps, We're probably one of the best competitive strategies in the history of Absolutely. the computer industry. Cisco's up there too. <laughs> and there's a right, Oracle. You, you name the big apples now in there. So they have competitive advantage. There's some lock-in, but mm -hmm. now in open, it's harder to do lock-in. Mm -hmm. So the new barrier to entry or inimitability or competitive advantage is scale. So the fence to, to jump as a new entrant into the market is scale. Do you agree? I do, but I think, I think it's not just infrastructure scale. It's operational scale. Yeah, it's scale, scale of expertise, right? Yeah. All of those things are, how do, I, how do I do it bigger, smarter, with better service at scale? We always use the Chipotle example on our team. Chipotle's real simple concept, but they scale. Yeah. It's hard to emulate that yeah, fast. That's right. So there's just economies of scale. So what you're saying is, like software, it's concepts, hey, I want to do a cloud. I'm going to be like Amazon. Mm -hmm. Well, good luck with that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, try to copy Amazon mm -hmm. over a decade. <laughs> so what do, what do people do? So maybe this consolidation happening, so engineers are worried about platforms, right? They don't want to mm -hmm. build on a platform that's not mm -hmm going to yeah. be closed down tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah. they yeah. want an open. So what is the developer mindset? I guess the question is, what is the developer psyche right now? Because I want to work with people that I know that are, or have interest levels as me, and I want to get distribution from my product or whatever the code is, yeah. and I don't want it to be out of business. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a demographic to developers. You know, they, at certain points they care about certain things, right? Uh, you know, for years we faced competition from, uh, from from other companies who offered services, like infrastructure services that were like ours at a lower cost. And, and you know, the way our business was structured around support and everything, we carried overhead to offer that service that they didn't. And so we would have customers that you know, would, would say, hey, I'm going to this lower cost place, or we had our customers that would never start with us because uh, you know, this was cheaper. That's all they were looking at. And then they started selling. It's like the insurance side, right? right? And the yeah, app took to off and things got hard and they're calling <laughs> that service provider and they're saying, hey, you know, I'm broken, get me online, right? At, at this point, the, you know, the, the five buck difference you're going to spend on a, on a virtual machine or whatever doesn't matter anymore. You have a business to sustain. You're not a big enterprise yet, but you, you know, you're, you're mission critical at this point, right? And, and when I think about that, I say there's, there's differentiated forms of service in this business that different types, different demographics of customers will look for. You have some that say, I'm just going to do it all on my own, right? Uh, Every, every last bit of it, from the concept of what the service is down to all the engineering work. A lot of those guys start in big clouds and sometimes they move to Colo or they just master those clouds. You have others that are sort of looking at it more like, I already have a business, you know, I have something, I, I, I realize I need to evolve it, right? For that sort, uh, you know, they, they want more of that service and more of that help getting in, right? It, it's easy to think like all the applications that exist today, were just created in the last few years, and those are the only ones that matter. To the vast majority of the spend in this market is still with an evolving IT group, right? With an evolving set of apps that people continue to value. And I think it's really easy to forget about them. We want, we want, to, we want to be able to support all of them, right? But you got to meet them where they're at. And I think, I think in this market, different providers differentiate on how they meet those customers and so, where. So Aaron, final question for you. For the yeah. folks watching out there, describe to them what's going on at this event. What's the main vibe? What is this all about? I've heard this open compute summit thing. What's happening here on the ground, around us, state of the industry? What's your, how would you explain it to them? Yeah, I think we're remaking the systems and the technology upon which most of this world operates. And we're doing it a piece of the world at, the at a time, right? And it's continuing to expand from there. And we're doing it in a way that is empowering the operators, the end users, and every other participant 
to do it the way that they want to do it uh -huh. and determine which one has the best model. I, I mean, I, in microcosm, I think that's basically what we're doing. At a large scale, I think we're actually creating an approach that's going to drive other industries to think and act the same, even if it's not directly IT. You look at what's going on here and how fast this industry is changing as a result of this sort of thing, and then you start looking at some other industries that are more stagnant, and you start saying, man, how could I enable my industry to go through change that fast and that disruptive? And I think some want to go drive and do that. That's great. We appreciate your time on theCUBE. We've opened open power and rack space. You guys have done some great work, congratulations. And again, it's super exciting here. This is where the next industry innovation will come out of. Our prediction is there's unicorns in this room, billion dollar valuations. I was kidding, certainly there are companies here with a billion dollar value. Intel, Intel. Uh, I HP. mean startups. The big whales are here, <laughs> but really entrepreneurial activity. It's really hot. This is theCUBE. Of course, we're on the trenches extracting that signal and sharing that with you. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Thank you guys.